Hello and welcome to the Center for Medicare and Medicaid Services 2017 Program Measurement Needs and Priorities uh, webinar. Today's primary focus is to provide measurement needs and priorities for each Medicare program involved in the pre-rulemaking process. <clears throat> Excuse me. My name is Martin Alvarado of Patel, and along with Mary Sheehan, we will be moderating today's webinar. Now to review some housekeeping items. All participants are muted and will remain muted. At any time during this session, you can type questions using the webinar's text format question and answer feature. You can see this feature in the lower right of your screen. Type your questions and click send. Please make sure to ask your questions only through the Q&A window and not through the chat option. There will be a Q&A session after each segment in today's presentation. When asking questions about a specific program, please indicate the program and, if possible, the presenter you'd like to answer your question. As time permits, we will read questions aloud for presenters to answer. Questions that are of general interest but are not answered during the call may be added to the pre-rulemaking frequently asked questions document available on the pre-rulemaking website after today's webinar. The meeting is being recorded and will be posted on the CMS pre-rulemaking website in an on-demand video format for later viewing. The host will send all participants a link to the recording as soon as it is available. I am pleased to introduce Michelle Jeppe of CMS, who will host the remainder of today's webinar. Thank you, Martin. Hopefully everyone can hear me okay. Martin, is my voice coming through loud and clear? It is. Okay, thank you. I'm extremely honored to be here sharing information with you about this important topic, pre-rulemaking. Again, my name is Michelle Jeppe. I am the agency's lead for pre-rulemaking, which is a process that's been around since 2011. Many of you are already familiar with pre-rulemaking, but hopefully we will touch on some topics that maybe will refresh your memory or possibly provide you with some new bits of information. Like Martin said, today's focal point is centered around providing our stakeholders with CMS's program-specific needs and priorities for this year's pre-rulemaking cycle. Today's meeting is number three in our education and outreach series, um, in our series of four. If you missed last week's sessions, no worries. They were recorded and will be available on the CMS pre-rulemaking website. All right, and here are, is an overview of the topics that we're going to be covering today. I just want to announce one quick change to segment one. Um, we have moved up the skilled nursing facility value-based purchasing program to be included uh, with segment one chronic and post-acute care programs for those of you uh, that were only planning to listen uh, to segment three. So that one program is going to be now in segment one. Um, I'm joined here at the CMS's central office with many of my colleagues. Some are present in the room and some are joined with us uh, virtually. And uh, now it's my pleasure to turn it over to Dr. Theodore Long from CMS's Center for Clinical Standards and Quality. Dr. Long is the Senior Medical Officer in the Quality Measurement and Value-Based Incentives Group. So take it away, Dr. Long. All right, next slide, please. Oh, thank you all for taking the time to join us today. To provide a little bit of background and to orient you a little bit to how we're organized in the Quality Measurement and Value-Based Incentives Group for Quinvig, we have a variety of divisions I will outline briefly here. The Division of Quality Measurement oversees the measures development for psychiatric and hospital programs. The Division of Value, Incentives, and Quality Reporting is more on the programmatic and operation side of the hospital programs and the ESRD QUIP program, working closely with the Division of Quality Measurement as well. The Division of Electronic and Clinician Quality leads the Merit-Based Incentive Payment System, or as you may have heard it referred to as MIPS, piece of MACRA, or as you may have heard it referred to as the Quality Payment Program. They've also historically led the PQRS work and align closely with folks who work on the value modifier and meaningful use as well. As for the meaningful use piece, that work is led by the Division of Health IT. The Division of Chronic and Post-Acute Care manages our post-acute care quality programs. The Measures Development and National Quality Forum work, including pre-rulemaking, falls under the Division of Program and Measurement Support. Not reflected in this slide are the other parts of the agency that Quimvig collaborates with, including the Center for Medicare and Medicaid Innovation, or CMMI, 
and the Center for Medicare, or CM. Next slide, please. The middle of this slide reflects the three aims of the National Quality Strategy. Better care, healthier people and healthier communities, and smarter spending. The inaugural National Quality Strategy, or NQS, was published on March 18, 2011. Quite a few years later, the NQS continues to be the national strategy and serves as a catalyst and compass for nationwide focus. The CMS Quality Strategy pursues an alliance with the three broad aims of the National Quality Strategy. We also reflect on this slide the six priorities from the National Quality Strategy that became the goals for CMS's Quality Strategy. Under each of these goals, we have systematically gone through a similar process at a detailed level that CMS did to further develop when operationalizing the National Quality Strategy goals. We identified desired outcomes, objectives, initiatives, and activities. Next slide, please. When developing the goals, we also came up with four foundational principles that apply to each and every goal and guide the agency's action toward each of these goals. These principles are eliminate racial and ethnic disparities, strengthen infrastructure and data systems, enable local innovations, and foster learning organizations. We felt that unless these four foundational principles are explicitly incorporated into the operational plan to achieve our goals, CMS will not succeed in driving change to improve the quality and cost of care for all. Next slide, please. Finally, I want to offer a Quinvig leadership welcome. We've had a successful year in 2016. We had great feedback from our MAP members, and this has driven the measures we are proposing in our programs. In looking towards 2017, we have really worked to streamline the measures in our programs, and in an effort to focus on burden, expect to have a streamlined MUC list. Additionally, we expect to more granularly identify measures we anticipate considering for our programs versus measures that we use as examples for important stakeholder conversations in cutting edge areas, such as patient report outcome measures or population health measures. With that, thank you very much again for your time, and I'll turn it back over. All right, thank you, Dr. Long. This is Michelle Jeppe, and uh, if you could move to the next slide, please, pre-rulemaking. All right, so most of you are probably already familiar with the statute and its requirements. If so, this is a refresher for you. Pre-rulemaking got underway with Section 3014 of the Patient Protection and Affordable Care Act. The law provides the statutory authority for the work that's associated with pre-rulemaking and drives CMS's deadline to publish the measures under consideration list annually by December 1st. The second step involves the Measures Application Partnership, or MAP, a convening body of multi-stakeholder groups. The MAP is currently operated and overseen by the National Quality Forum, or NQS. The MAP convenes each December and January to deliberate and vote on each measure under consideration list measure. And now for the third step. NQF facilitates these meetings and furnishes a report of their findings each February and March. Next slide, please. Our program experts looked at the program goals and statutory requirements and found some basic measure submission requirements similar across programs. They are listed here as a reference for you. These requirements are elaborated on in the 2017 Measurement Needs and Priorities document in the Measure Selection Requirements section. This document was included as in the meeting materials for this webinar and is also included on the CMS pre-rulemaking website in the Additional Resources section. To note in particular, measures should be fully developed and tested for reliability and validity. CMS is soliciting for measures that fill performance gaps and align with measures across programs and across HHS, as well as private payer programs. And finally, measure submission should have a numerator, denominator, and exclusion criteria that is not likely to change. Next slide, please. For assistance with submitting your measures, refer to the Measures Under Consideration User Guide for more specifics. Sorry, if you could move to the next slide, Martin. <clears throat> we should be on 11.
All right, thank you. Um, the guide as well as a host of additional resources is available on the CMS website. The website link is also found on slide 19 in this deck. New candidate measures are being accepted now through June 30th. All right, if you could move to slide 12. All right, as I said earlier, today's focal point is centered around providing stakeholders with the CMS program specific needs and priorities for this year's pre-rulemaking cycle. The goal is to align these needs and priorities with candidate measure submissions. The August 3rd meeting is for federal stakeholders only to preview the list and to gain consensus. At this meeting, it is critical for CMS to learn of any federal stakeholder objections to avoid after clearance changes. The ultimate goal of the August 4th federal meeting is to seek approval of the proposed measures prior to the commencement of clearance that starts on August 21st. CMS strives for a clean, transparent clearance process for all federal stakeholders involved in pre-rulemaking. All right, and with that, I'd like to move to slide 13. We're gonna kick off the next segment of our, uh, of our agenda here where we hear from our measure and program leads. Um, the first segment is chronic and post-acute care programs, and we are joined virtually by Chris Gross, who is gonna talk to us about inpatient rehabilitation facility quality reporting. So Chris, if you wanna take it away. Thanks, Michelle. Good morning, everyone. Can you hear me okay? We can, thank you. Okay, great, thank you. Um, so some background, um, the Inpatient Rehabilitation Facility Quality Reporting Program, also known as the ERF QRP, was established by Section 3004B of the Affordable Care Act. ERFs that receive payment from the ERF PPS are required to participate in the Quality Reporting Program. This includes both freestanding ERFs as well as ERFs located within acute care facilities and critical access hospitals. Beginning with fiscal year 2014, ERFs that fail to submit the required data are subject to a two percentage point reduction in their annual payment update. We also began public reporting of quality measures on ERF Compare in December 2016. The Improving Medicare Post-Acute Care Transformation Act of 2014 also known as the IMPACT Act, directs the Secretary to require ERFs, long-term care hospitals, skilled nursing facilities, and home health agencies to report standardized assessment data and data on quality measures, including resource use measures. The IMPACT Act further requires CMS to develop and implement quality measures from five specified measure domains, as well as three specified resource use and other measures domains. Standardized data will be collected using the assessment instruments currently used by the post-acute care providers to submit data to CMS. For ERFs, this is the ERF PI, also the, known as the ERF Patient Assessment Instrument, um, which is an instrument they are currently using. Um, to date, the ERF Quality Reporting Program has adopted 18 measures to address the National Quality Strategy measure domains. And if you switch to the next slide, please. Specifically, these domains are effective prevention and treatment, making care safer, the domain of communication and care coordination, making care affordable, and patient and family engagement. The table displays the breakdown of the measures with their corresponding domain. We have identified two domains as high priority for future measure consideration for the Earth Quality Reporting Program. To address the domain of making care safer, CMS is considering changes to the percent of residents or patients with pressure ulcers that are new or worsened, which currently exist in the ERF Quality Reporting Program. In addition, to address the domain of communication and care coordination, CMS is considering development of a measure to assess data that is shared and how providers communicate that information during transitions of care. And with that, I will turn it over to Kelly. Hi, my name is Kelly Miles. <clears throat> Can you guys hear me okay? We can. Thanks, Kelly. Okay, great. Um, the Long-Term Care Hospital Quality Reporting Program, or LTEC QRP, was established in accordance with Section 1886M5 of the Social Security Act, as amended by Section 3004A of the Affordable Care Act. The LTEC QRP applies to all LTEC providers that are paid under the LTEC Prospective Payment Pro System. Excuse me. 
Data sources for LTEC QRP measures include long-term care hospital care data set, LCDS records, Medicare FFS, FFS claims, and the Center for Disease Control's National Health Safety Network data submissions. The LTEC QRP measure, develop, measure development and selection activities take into account established national priorities and input from multi-stakeholder groups. Beginning in FY 2014, LTECs that fail to submit the required data are subject to a two percentage point reduction in their annual payment update. We began public re publicly reporting of quality measures on the LTEC care compare site in December 2016. To date, the LTEC quality reporting program has adopted 17 measures to address the national quality strategy quality measure domains. Specifically, these domains are effective prevention and treatment, making care safer, communication, care coordination, best practice of healthy living, making care affordable, and patient and family engagement. The table displays the breakdown of the measures with their corresponding domain. To address the domain of making care safer, the LTEC QRP is considering substantial changes to the percent of residents or, pre or patients with pressure ulcers that are new or worsened, which currently exists in the LTEC QRP. To address the communication care coordination, CMS is considering development of a measure to assess data that is shared and how providers communicate that information during transitions of care. To address the effective prevention and treatment, having measures related to ventilator use, ventilator-associated events, and ventilator weaning rates are a high priority for CMS. CMS is also considering a depression assessment and management quality measure. To address the domain of patient and family engagement, CMS is working to develop a CAP survey, and the LTEC setting is considering other patient and family concepts for the future. Thank you. All right, Kelly, thank you very much. Now I'm going to turn it over to Joan Proctor, who is going to talk to us about Home Health Care Quality Reporting Program. Take it away, Joan. Okay, thank you. Um, can everyone hear me? We can. Thanks. You're welcome. Uh, the Home Health Quality Reporting, probably one of the more uh, older of the quality reporting programs in CMS, uh, was established in accordance with Section 1895B, 3B, Five, two of the Social Security Act. Uh, home health agencies are required by the Act to submit quality data for use in evaluating quality for home health agencies. Uh, Section 1895 also requires that HHAs that do not submit the quality data uh, to the Secretary are subject to a 2% reduction in their annual payment update, effective calendar year 2007 and every subsequent year. The data sources for the Home Health Quality Reporting Program include OASIS and Medicare fee-for-service claims data. Data is publicly reported on the Home Health Compare website. The Home Health Quality Reporting measure development and selection activities take into account established national priorities and input from multi-stakeholder groups. Further, the Improving the Impact Act uh, amends the Social Security Act to direct the Secretary to require uh, LTECs, ERFs, SNFs, and home health agencies to report standardized patient assessment data and data on quality measures, including resource use measures. The IMPACT Act requires CMS to develop and implement quality measures from five measure domains, functional status, cognitive function, and changes in function and cognitive function, skin integrity and changes in skin integrity, medication reconciliation, incident of major falls, and the transfer of health information when the individual transitions from the hospital, critical access hospital, to the PAC provider or from a PAC provider to another setting. The Impact also, Act also delineates the implementation of resource uses and other measures in at least these following, in at least these following domains. Total estimated Medicare spending per beneficiary, 
discharge community and all condition risk assessed, uh, adjusted potentially preventable hospital readmission rates. Um, in terms of the current measures, um, the table that we have uh, provided here, uh, we do want to make a correction here um, for uh, the uh, measure domain for patient and family engagement. We do have a typo in our slides, and it should indicate five measures that we have implemented. Clearly, we have not implemented uh, 59. So, next slide. Okay, in terms of high pro priority domains for future measure consideration, CMS has identified uh, three uh, domains that are high priority for future measure consideration. In terms of patient, the first is patient and family engagement, and there we are considering functional status and functional decline as important to assess for residents in home health settings. Patients who receive care while in a home health may have functional limitations and may be at risk for further decline in function due to limited mobility and ambulation. The second domain, making care safer, uh, we have safety for individuals in a home-based setting is also something that uh, under consideration and priority for the home health quality reporting. As persons in a home health setting are at risk for major injury due to falls, new or worse in pressure ulcers, pain, and functional decline. Um, and the last domain, uh, effective communication and coordination of care, again, is another uh, area under consideration. And for there, like the other programs, we have the communication of health information, um, which is critical to ensuring safe and effective transitions from one care setting to another. Medication errors, poor communication, and poor co uh, coordination between providers, along with rising incidence of preventable adverse events and hospital readmissions emphasize the importance of the timely transfer of health information and care preferences at transition. And uh, that's the end of the presentation for the Home Health QRP. Thanks, Michelle. Thanks, Joan. Okay, so next we have Cindy Masuda that's going to talk to us about the hospital, I'm sorry, excuse me, hospice quality reporting. Take it away, Cindy. Thank you. Good morning. And can everyone hear me? Yes, we can hear you. Thank you. Good morning. The Hospice Quality Reporting Program was established in accordance with, this, with Section 1814I of the Social Security Act as amended by Section 3004C of the Affordable Care Act. The Hospice Quality Reporting Program applies to all hospice regardless of setting. The Hospice Quality Reporting measure development and selection activities take into account established national priorities and input from multi-stakeholder groups. Beginning in FY 2014, hospices that fail to submit quality data will be subject to a two percentage point reduction to their annual payment update. And the table below that is provided in this uh, presentation details the number of hospice quality reporting program measures um, that's prioritized under the National Quality Strategy. They're currently implemented or proposed they're in the program. And there's right now, there's nine previous, um, currently has nine previously finalized quality measures. And as you can see in the table, um, these domains are the effective prevention and treatment, making care safer, communication, care coordination, best practices of healthy living, making care affordable, patient and family engagement. So the high priority domains for future measurement um, consideration, we have five. And these include the effective prevention and treatment, Symptom management outcome measures are high priority for the hospice quality reporting program. And since there's a lack of tested and endorsed outcome measures for hospice across domains of hospice care, including symptom management, developing and implementing outcome measures for hospices is important for providers, patients, and families, and other stakeholders because symptom management is a central aspect of hospice care. Communication, care coordination, and or patient, patient and family engagement is a second high priority area. And patient preference for care is difficult to measure at the end of life when patients may or may not be able to state their preferences and may have changes in their preferences. However, a central tenet of the hospice care is responsiveness to patient and family care preferences. As much as possible, patient preference should be incorporated into new measure development. Patient and family engagement, 
That measure of goal attainment is naturally linked to determining patient family preferences. Quality care and hospice should address not only establishing what the patient and family desires, but also providing care and services in line with those preferences. And then making care safer is the fourth priority area, and timeliness and responsiveness of care is the focus here. And while timeliness of referral to hospice is not within a hospice's control, hospice initiation of treatment, once a patient has, elect, has elected the hospice benefit, is under the control of the hospice. Responsiveness of the hospice during time of patient or family need is an important indicator about hospice services for consumers in particular. And then can finally, communication, care coordination. Measurement of care coordination is integral to the provision of quality care and should be aligned across care settings. And so with that, I turn it back to, um, to Michelle. Cindy, I have it. Thank you so much. Okay, so I'm joined by Tara McMullen. She's here and she's gonna to talk to us about skilled nursing facility quality, quality reporting. Take it away, Tara. Hi, thanks, Michelle. This is Tara McMullen and today I'm presenting on behalf of the SNF QRP coordinator, Michelle King. So like our sister programs here in post-acute care, the Improving Medicare Post-Acute Care Transformation Act of 2014, otherwise known as the IMPACT Act, added Section 1899B of the Social Security Act to establish the Skilled Nursing Facility Quality Reporting Program, or the SNF QRP. Skilled nursing facilities that submit data under the SNF PPS are required to participate in the SNF QRP, excluding units that are affiliated with critical access hospitals or cause. Data sources for the SNF QRP include Medicare fee-for-service claims data or the MDS, the minimum data set. The SNF QRP measure development and selection activities take into account established national priorities and input from multi-stakeholder groups like our sister programs. Beginning in fiscal year 2018, providers that fail to submit required quality data to CMS for this quality reporting program will have their annual updates reduced by two percentage points. The IMPACT Act is the guiding uh, act that mandates the SNF QRP, and like our sister programs, the IMPACT Act mandates that LPACs, ERS, SNFs, and home health agencies report standardized patient assessment data and data on quality measures, including resource use measures and standardized data assessment items to fulfill specified clinical assessment domains. The SNF QRP currently has seven finalized uh, uh, measures in the program, two in the domain of making care safer, three in the domain of communication and care coordination, one in the domain of making care affordable, and one for patient and family engagement. Next slide. There are three high priority domains for future measure consideration for the SNF QRP. To address the domain of making care safer, safer, patient safety is a key priority for us. It's an important priority as persons or individuals in SNFs can be at risk for major injury as a result of conditions such as new or worsening pressure ulcers. Therefore, CMS is considering modifications to the percent of residents or patients with pressure ulcers that are new or worsening. That measure currently exists in the SNF QRP. To address the domain of patient and family engagement, CMS is considering for future measure consideration function, measures of function. Functional status and functional decline are important to assess for residents and SNFs. Residents seeking care in SNFs include those whose injuries, illness, or condition has resulted in a loss of function or for whom rehab care is expected to gain, regain that function. Therefore, among SNF residents receiving rehab services, the amount of therapy prescribed can vary widely, and the variation is not always associated with resident characteristics. This variation in rehab services supports the need to monitor SNF residents' functional outcome, and we believe there's an opportunity for improvement in this area. Finally, to address the domain of effective care, uh, communication, and coordination of care, like our sister programs, we are assessing uh, communication of health information which is critical to ensure safe and effective transitions from one healthcare setting to another. Um, like our sister programs, medication errors, poor communication, and poor coordination between providers um, basically emphasizes, those issues emphasize the importance of timely transfer of health information and care preferences at transitions. And now I'm gonna turn it over to my colleague, Dr. Alan Levitt, to present on the Skilled Nursing Facility Value-Based Purchasing Program. Thank you, Dr. McMullen. Uh, today I'll be representing the Skilled Nursing Facility Value-Based Purchasing Program team. 
the Skilled Nursing Facility Value-Based Purchasing Program, or SNF-CBP, was established by the Protecting Access to Medicare Act in, 19, uh, in 2014. The federal per diem rate for SNFs is reduced by 2%, and then an incentive payment is applied based on facility performance on a readmission measure. The first measure implemented for the SNF DBP program was an all-cause readmission measure. In 2016, we specified a potentially preventable readmission measure that will ultimately take its place in assessing quality performance. Due to the statute, CMS lacks the authority to implement additional measures, and so we are not currently seeking additional quality measures for the month list. However, we are open to feedback regarding substantive changes that might be incorporated in the two existing measures, which would be appropriate to take to the Measure Applications Partnership for review. So now I'll turn it back over to Michelle Jeffy. Michelle? All right, thank you. Thanks, everyone. I appreciate uh, everyone taking their time to present their programs this morning for segment one, which was chronic and post-acute care programs. And now we're going to move into the question and answer segment of our program. Um, Martin, if you're there, if you could just repeat the instructions on how uh, audience members should submit their questions, that would be wonderful. Hi, sure. Um, at any time, feel free to use the Q&A window in the lower right-hand side of the screen. Um, enter your question. Make sure you, you, uh, you click Send. Um, also, if you could please uh, do us the favor of when, when asking questions, submitting questions, to um, specify the program and also the presenter that you'd like to answer your question. Um, so feel free to uh, begin entering questions if you have any. Thank you. All right, thank you, Martin. All right, and now I'm gonna I'm gonna uh, refer to uh, Mary Sheehan uh, for those questions that have been submitted thus far. If if you could uh, let us know what we have in queue, that would be wonderful. Sure. At, at this point, Michelle, we don't have any uh, questions in the queue, so we will give um, people a minute to start submitting their questions. Um, but as of now, there are, are no questions. Okay, awesome. We'll pause for a moment or two and, and see if we, if we are able to get any questions. And if not, we'll move right into segment two, which is ambulatory care. And we have uh, Jennifer Harris that's going to be presenting the merit-based incentive payment system momentarily if, if we don't get a question. Pause for one moment. Okay, Michelle, I'm not seeing any questions, so um, if you want to wait a little longer, we can, or if you want to move into the next one, and I can table um, some questions for um, an FAQ sheet uh, that we could share at the, uh, after the session is over. All right, thanks, Mary, I appreciate it. All right, so we are gonna move then into the merit-based incentive uh, I'm sorry, the Merit-Based Incentive Payment System, or MIPS. Uh, we have Jennifer Harris, who's joined with us uh, virtually. Jennifer, if you'd like to begin your discussion of MIPS, that would be wonderful. Thank you, and hello, everyone. Can you hear me okay? Yes, we can hear you. Thank you. Great. As you may, all, may already know, the Merit-Based Incentive Payment System, or MIPS, was established by the Medicare Access and CHIP Reauthorization Act of 2015, or MACRA, which repeals the Medicare Sustainable Growth Rate and improves Medicare payment for physician services. MACRA consolidates the current programs of the Physician Quality Reporting System, PQRS, the Value-Based Modifier, VM, and the Electronic Health Records, EHR, Incentive Program to one program known as MIPS. There are currently 271 measures in the MIPS program that cover various measure domains. If we can scroll down to the table, I would like to point out areas of high priority for future MIPS consideration. 
MIPS has a priority focus on outcome measures and measures that are relevant for specialty providers. CMS will propose the implementation of measures that meet the MIPS criteria of having performance gaps and measure, gap, measure set gaps. CMS has identified high priority measures for future consideration, which include person and caregiver-centered caregiver experience and outcomes, communication and care coordination, efficiency and cost reduction, patient safety, and appropriate use. Please note that measures implemented in MIPS may be available for pub public reporting on Physician Compare, and preference will be given to electronically specified measures, also known as ECQMs. Measures that are considered for potential inclusion in MIPS must meet certain criteria at a minimum for selection into the program. First, measures must be fully developed and ready for implementation at the time of submission. Reliability and validity testing must be conducted for measures. Feasibility testing must be conducted for ECQMs, and ECQMs must have MAT output. Testing data must accompany submissions. For example, if a measure is being submitted as a registry and as an ECQM, the testing data for both versions must be submitted. Additionally, measure performance and evidence should identify opportunities for improvement. CMS does not intend to implement measures in which evidence identifies high levels of performance with little variation or opportunity for improvement. ECQMs must meet EHR system infrastructure requirements and must be able to transmit and receive requirements as identified in MIPS regulation. And finally, Section 101 of, the macro, of MACRA requires submission of new measures for publication in applicable specialty appropriate peer reviewed journals prior to implementing in MIPS. The peer reviewed journal template provided by CMS must accompany each measure submission. Please see the template for additional information. The template can also be found on the CMS pre-rulemaking website, along with a completed example of what the template should look like. If you have additional questions, please email us and I will gladly respond. Thank you. I will turn it back over to Michelle. All right. Thanks, Jennifer. All right. So we are joined also virtually by Rabia Khan. She's going to talk to us about Medicare Shared Savings Program. So take it away, Rabia. Thank you, Michelle. So Section 3022 of the Affordable Care Act required CMS to establish a shared savings program that promotes accountability for a patient population, coordinates items and services under Medicare Parts A and B, and encourages investment in, in infrastructure and redesigned care processes for high quality and efficient service delivery. The Medicare Shared Savings Program was designed to facilitate coordination and cooperation among providers to improve the quality of care for Medicare fee-for-service beneficiaries and reduce the rate of growth in healthcare costs. Eligible providers, hospitals, and suppliers may voluntarily participate in the Shared Savings Program by creating or participating in an Accountable Care Organization, or an ACO. If ACOs meet program requirements and the quality performance standard, they're eligible to share in savings if earned. Currently, there are three shared savings options within the program. So there's a one-sided risk model, as well as two different two-sided risk models for participation. The Affordable Care Act actually specifies appropriate measures of clinical processes and outcomes, patient and wherever practicable caregiver experience of care, and utilization, and, and, that, an a, and that an ACL may include the following types of groups of providers and suppliers of Medicare covered services. So ACO professionals and group practice arrangements, networks of individual practices of ACO professionals, partnerships or joint ventures arrangements between hospitals and ACO professionals or hospitals employing ACO professionals, and other Medicare providers and suppliers as determined by the secretary. Under our Shared Savings Program Quality Measurement Approach, we have 31 measures across four equally weighted domains, which are developed based on national quality strategy priorities. 
So as you can see in this table, the first domain is our patient caregiver experience domain. And for 2017, we have eight quality measures. The care coordination patient safety domain includes 10 quality measures. Our preventive health domain has eight measures. And then our clinical care for at-risk population has five measures. Measure changes are made public in the physician fee schedule rule. I do want to note that due to our alignment with uh, the quality payment program, any web interface measure updates that are made will be done through the quality payment program rule. So as I've noted, the shared savings program actually, uh, the quality reporting requirements are closely aligned with the quality payment program. And for our 31 measures, data is collected via claims the quality payment program advancing care information data, uh, the CAPS for ACO survey, and data reported by ACOs through the CMS web interface. So in terms of measure requirements, when thinking about measures to include in our program's measure set, we're largely focused on outcome measures that address conditions that are high cost and affect a high volume of Medicare patients, measures that target uh, the needs and gaps in care for Medicare fee-for-service patients and their caregivers, measures that align with other CMS quality reporting initiatives, and in particular, the quality payment program, measures that support improved individual and population health, and also measures that align with recommendations from the Core Quality Measures Collaborative. All right, thank you. Thank you, Michelle. All right, thank you, Rabia. So I did see a question that had come in. Uh, basically, folks are wondering where the document is that, uh, that our presenters are referring to. That document is called the 2017 Measures Under Consideration List, Program-Specific Measure Priorities and Needs. It is available on the CMS pre-rulemaking website. That website link is found at the, on the last slide within this deck. It was also included as part of the meeting materials that, that were sent out as well. So hopefully that clarifies your question. Um, so I, I'm going to turn it back over to Mary. Do you see any other questions here for our presenters um, as part of segment two? Uh, yes, I do. I have a question. Um, I believe this came in for uh, Jennifer Harris from the MIPS program um, from, from Suzanne Pope. Um, and the question is, have any measures been published yet? And if so, in what journal? Okay, um, I'm actually joined here uh, by Dr. Theodore Long. He's going to take that question. So. Okay. Hold on, he's just moving closer to the phone, folks. Thank you. Thank you for asking that question. So as Jennifer was saying, the requirement is for the measures to, uh, that are used to be submitted to a journal for publication. Uh, that requirement, which we can go into more detail, um, has been met. However, um, the measures themselves in terms of actually having been published, uh, that piece, which is not part of the legislative requirement, but is an ongoing process for us. Um, we want to go through the publication process the way every other article does, and as you know, that takes some time. So we appreciate the question. You can expect from us to always make sure that we're meeting the specific requirement, but to the greatest extent possible, hopefully using publications as a way to inform as many people as possible about the work that we're doing about our measures. So thank you. Thank you, Dr. Long. Okay, uh, Mary, do we have any other questions for segment two presenters? Yes, we do. We have another one for the MIPS program, um, and the question is, can um, the MAT, the MAT, be used to author MIPS measures, or only the ECQMs can be authored via the MAT? So, um, hi, this is Jennifer. Can you repeat that? Are you, are, just to clarify the question, are you asking if whether only ECQMs can have a MAT output? Um, the question, I'll just, I'll read it again, and it refers to the MAT being used to author measures. So it says, can MAT be used to author MIPS measures or only the ECQMs can be allowed to author via the MAT? So I'm not sure if I clearly understand the question, but all ECQMs submitted must have MAT output. So they must be put into the MAT and have a MAT number um, as they are submitted through JIRA for consideration. Okay, thank you. 
Um, it does not appear at this time that we have any other questions for segment two. Um, so I, we can either give it a minute, Michelle, or if you'd like to continue on to segment three, I will table any questions um, for later. Okay, thanks, Mary. I think we're going to keep moving. Okay. Um, okay, so segment three is next on our agenda with hospital programs. We are joined here at the CMS Central Office by Jesse Roach. He's going to talk to us about end-stage renal disease quality incentive programs. So take it away. Hello, the, hello, the ESRD, um, or end-stage renal disease quality incentive program, or QIP, is a value-based purchasing program that assesses the quality of care provided by dialysis facilities and then applies a payment reduction of up to 2% based on quality performance. Since its inception in payment year 2012, the QIP has grown from making whole process measures to a program that broadly assesses many of the key quality domains found in the CMS quality strategy. The Medicare Improvements for Patients and Providers Act of 2008 mandated the inclusion of measures of dialysis adequacy, anemia management, mineral bone disease, vascular access, and patient experiences of care. Today's QUIP includes all of these measures and has expanded to address patient infections, hospitalizations, and monitoring of pain and depression. However, substantial gaps remain in the QUIP and we seek the community support in addressing some of these highest priority areas in this and future years. These domains include care coordination, um, avoiding readmissions is only part of the complex mission of coordinating care for ESRD patients. Areas of interest include medication management, coordinating with transplant centers, and coordination of care for transient patients. Patient safety. ESRD dialysis patients are often immunocompromised and receive their treatment on a regular and ongoing basis, increasing the importance of ensuring their safety in the healthcare system. Patient recording outcomes and experience of care. At present, only the ICH CAPS addresses patient reported outcomes in the QIP. Maintaining physical function, independence, and quality of life are important for a population receiving care for ongoing chronic illness. And finally, access to transplantation. The QIP does not directly address the role of dialysis facilities in maximizing access to kidney transplants among potential candidates, a key health outcome for the ESRD dialysis population. Thanks. All right, thank you. So now we're going to turn it over to Robert Morgan, who is here with us. He's going to talk to us about hospital acquired condition reduction program. Take it away. Thank you, Michelle. In October 2014, CMS began reducing Medicare payments for subsection D hospitals that ranked in the worst performing quartile with respect to hospital acquired conditions. The quality measures in the program seek to promote quality of care by reducing the number of hacks in the hospital acute care setting. All measures adopted for the program follow the criteria established by the Deficit Reduction Act of 2005, and that they consist of high volume or high cost conditions that could be prevented by the use of evidence-based guidelines. The program further requires that all measures be risk adjusted. Domain 1 focuses on patient safety and includes ERIC's PSI-90 composite, which captures occurrences of adverse events among Medicare FFS discharges. We selected this measure for Domain 1 because the measure is risk-adjusted at the patient level and identifies adverse events occurring across units within a facility. Domain 2 focuses on hospital-acquired infections and includes CDC's NHSN, CLABSI, CAUTI, SSI, MRSA, and CDI measures. These measures capture adverse events to Medicare and non-Medicare patients alike, are risk adjusted at the hospital level and patient care unit level, adjust for differences in levels of infection risk in patients, and identify adverse events at the unit level. All measures in the hack reduction program address the increased priority of making care safer. Measures selected for the program further our efforts to reduce hacks and improve patients' quality of care by reducing complications and mortality while simultaneously decreasing costs. The program has an emphasis on measures that are high cost, high volume, and reasonably preventable indicators of patient safety. Specific measures of interest include falls as injury, glycemic events, adverse drug events, and ventilator-associated events. And with that, I'd like to pass it on to DLA for HRRP. That's awesome. Thank wow. you. Thank you so much. Um, um, uh, 
I'll be uh, discussing the Hospital Readmissions Reduction Program uh, and subbing in for my colleague, Dr. Leanne, Leanne Hahn. So the Hospital Readmissions Reduction Program was established under Section 3025 of the Affordable Care Act. The overall purpose of the program is to reduce hospital readmissions by improving care coordination and transitions between care settings. The program accomplishes this by reducing payments to hospitals that have excess readmissions on one or more condition or procedure-specific readmission measures selected for the program. For the purposes of this program, a readmission is defined as an admission to an applicable hospital within 30 days of discharge from the same or another applicable hospital. Based on this definition, we are statutorily required to select measures for conditions or procedures in which readmissions are high volume or high, and high cost. Generally, measures must also be endorsed by a consensus-based entity with a contract under Section 1890 of the Act. However, CMS also has the authority to select other feasible and practical measures which have not been endorsed, as long as endorsed measures may, not have, may have been given due consideration. And based on these requirements, the program has currently adopted six measures for the program. Acute myocardial infar infarction, or AMI, heart failure, pneumonia, and in 2015, we added chronic obstructive pulmonary disease, or COPD, elective primary total hip and or total knee atheroplasty, and most recently, coronary artery bypass graft surgery, also known as cabbage. In terms of future measure considerations, we will continue to review the literature and guidance from stakeholders to identify high volume, high cost measures that emphasize the importance of the national quality priority area of care coordination. So that concludes my presentation, and I will turn it over to my colleague, Joanne Fitzell, to discuss the Hospital Inpatient Quality Reporting Program, the EHR Incentive Program, and the Hospital Value-Based Purchasing Program. Prescription Drug Improvement and Modernization Act of 2003 and expanded by the Deficit Reduction Act of 2005. The, hospital pro the, the program requires hospitals paid under the inpatient prospective payment systems to report on process, structure, outcomes, patient perspectives on care, efficiency, and cost of care measures. Hospitals that fail to meet the requirements of the HIQR will result in a reduction of one-fourth through their fiscal year IPPS annual payment update. The annual payment update includes inflation and costs of goods and services used by hospitals in treating Medicare patients. Hospitals that choose to not participate in the program receive reduction by that same amount. Hospitals not included in the HIQR, such as critical access hospitals and hospitals located in Puerto Rico and the U.S. territories, are permitted to participate in voluntary quality reporting. Performance of quality measures are publicly reported on the CMS Hospital Compare website. The American Recovery and Reinvestment Act of 2009 amends Titles 18 and 19 of the Social Security Act to authorize incentive payments to eligible hospitals and critical access hospitals that participate in the EHR incentive program to promote the adoption and meaningful use of certified electronic health record technology. EHs and CAHs are required to report on electronically, speci electronically specified clinical quality measures using CERT in order to qualify for incentive payments under the Medicare and Medicaid EHR incentive programs. All EHR incentive program requirements related to ECQM reporting will be addressed in IPPS rule making, including, but not limited to, new program requirements, reporting requirements, reporting and submission periods, reporting methods, alignment efforts between the HIQR and the Medicare EHR incentive program for EHS, 
and CAHs and information regarding the ECQM. You can conclude or you can move forward. You can refer to the table that's in the uh, in the slide, um, and it details the number of quality measures prioritized under each national quality strategy priority, which are currently implemented or proposed in each program as finalized to date. Thank you. All right. Thanks, Joanne. Okay, so we're we're also joined by Christy Boss. She's here with us. She's going to talk to us about the prospective payment system exempt cancer hospital QRP program. So okay. Take it away, Christy. Well, good morning, and uh, thank you for joining us this morning. So Section 3005 of the Affordable Care Act added new subsections to the Social Security Act, which gave CMS the authority to begin collecting data from PPS-exempt cancer hospitals. Uh, these PPS exempt cancer hospitals are cancer specialty facilities that are not paid under the inpatient prospective payment system. And there are about 11 of them in existence in the United States at this current time. Uh, the program requires that all PCHs submit data for selected quality measures. It's a voluntary program, so there are no financial disincentives to, to uh, participate or not to participate. Um, in the fiscal year 2012 IPPS rule, we adopted five NQF measures, and in 2014, I'm sorry, and in 20, the 2013 IPPS rule, one additional measure was adopted. Twelve new measures were adopted in the fiscal year 2014 IPPS rule, and one more measure was adopted in FY15. Uh, data collection for fiscal year 17 and fiscal year 18 reporting periods is currently underway. Uh, currently in the program, there are seven measures finalized for effective prevention and treatment, uh, five measures finalized for making care safer, two measures under communication and care coordination, one measure under best practice to enable healthy living, uh, one measure under making care affordable, one measure under person and family engagement, and no measures that we could not assign. Our high priority areas for the PCH program include communication and care coordination. We're looking for measures regarding care coordination with other facilities and outpatient settings such as hospice care. Uh, measures of the patient's functional status, quality of life, and end of life. The second area or domain is making care affordable. Uh, CMS is seeking measures related to efficiency, appropriateness, and utilization, over or under utilization, of cancer treatment modalities such as chemotherapy, radiation, and imaging. The third domain that, that is a priority is the person and family engagement domain, uh, measures related to patient-centered care planning, shared decision-making, and quality of life outcomes are needed for our program. I believe it was stated before, but measure requirements include the following. Uh, the measure must be responsive to specific program goals and statutory requirements. Um, they're required to reflect consensus among stakeholders and to, in, what, to the extent feasible be endorsed by the national consensus entity. Um, they're not required to be endorsed by the NQF, but, rec but highly recommended to be endorsed by the NQF, but they have to have some kind of a reflection of consensus among stakeholders. Uh, the secretary may select a measure in an area or topic in which a feasible and practicable measure is not, has not been endorsed. Um, if those that have been endorsed have been given due diligence. Sorry, I had a pop up on my screen. Um, measure specifications must be widely available and publicly available. Uh, the measure steward will provide CMS with all technical assistance, including clarifications on the measures as needed. Uh, measures must pr promote alignment with specific program attribute, 
attributes and across CMS and HHS programs. Uh, measure alignment should support the measurement across the patient's episode of care, demonstrated by assessment of the person's trajectory across providers and settings. A potential use of the measure in a program does not result in negative or unintended consequences. Uh, measures must be fully developed and tested, preferably in the PCH environment. Measures must be feasible to implement across PCHs. A measure must address an important condition or topic with a performance gap and have a strong scientific evidence base. And CMS, of course, has to have the resources to operationalize such a measure. And with that, I will turn it back to Michelle. All right, thank you, Christy. All right, we are joined by Venetia Mirror. She's gonna to talk to us about the Ambulatory Surgery Center Quality Reporting and Hospital Outpatient Quality Reporting, as well as the Inpatient Psychiatric Facility Quality Reporting Program. So take it away, Venetia. Thank you, Michelle. Good morning. Um, the Ambulatory Surgical Center Quality Reporting Program was established under the authority provided by Section 109B of the Medicare Improvements and Extension Act of 2006 and the Tax Relief and Health Care Act of uh, 2006. The statute provides the authority um, that requires uh, that ACAs paid under the AFC uh, fee schedule to report on quality measures. ASCs receive a two percentage point uh, payment penalty to their ASCFC annual payment updates for not meeting program requirements. Currently, we have 19 measures in the program um, as listed in the table below, and these fall under the six quality strategies. The high priority domains for future measure consideration that we are looking for um, fall under five of these categories, um, making care safer. Uh, we are looking for measures of infection rates, uh, person and family engagement, uh, best practices of healthy living, effective prevention and treatment, and communication and care coordination. So these are the quality domains that we are looking for uh, measures under. We also have some measure requirements, um, and those are listed um, in, in the document here, and I'll highlight a few for you. Um, CMS applies criteria for measures that may be considered for potential adoption in the ASCQR. At a minimum, the following requirements will be considered in selecting the measures. Um, I want to highlight that measures must address a NQS priority or a CMS strategy goal. Uh, measures must be field tested for the ASC clinical setting. Uh, it should be clinically useful. We also look for measures that supply sufficient case numbers for differentiation of ASC performance. Um, and we certainly uh, require that measures towards will provide CMS with technical assistance and clarifications on measures as needed. Um, so now, moving on to the hospital outpatient quality reporting program. The hospital outpatient quality reporting program was established by Section 109 of the Tax Relief and Healthcare Act of 2006. The program requires subsection D hospitals providing outpatient services paid under the outpatient prospective payment system to report on quality measures. Hospitals receive a two percentage point reduction of their annual payment update under the OPPS for non-participation in the program. Currently, we have 33 measures in the program, as listed in the table below, that fall under the six quality strategies. The high priority domains for future measure consideration that we are looking for are making care safer, uh, best practices of healthy living, patient and family engagement, communication, care coordination, um, and um, as I mentioned before, we have measure requirements for this program as well, and CMS applies criteria for measures that may be considered for potential adoption in the HOQR program, and to highlight a few of the measure requirements, um, measures must be fully developed, tested, and validated in the hospital or patient setting. Uh, feasibility of implementation is key, and an evaluation of the feasibility is based on factors 
uh, including but not limited to the level of burden associated with validating measure data, uh, the availability and practicability of measure specifications, and whether the identified CMS system for data collection is prepared to accommodate the proposed measures and timelines for collection. Uh, we also require that measures towards will provide CMS with technical assistance and clarifications on the measures as needed. Now moving on to the inpatient psychiatric facility quality reporting program. The IPFQR program was established by Section 1886S4 of the Social Security Act and added by Sections 3401F4 and 10322A of the Patient Protection and Affordable Care Act. Under current regulations, the program requires participating in patient psychiatric facilities to report on 16 quality measures or they will face a two percentage point reduction to their annual update. The measures currently um, implemented in the program are listed in the table. There are 16 measures. Um, the high priority domains for future measure consideration include patient and family engagement, effective prevention and treatment, best practices of healthy living, making, um, and making care affordable. Um, CMS applies criteria for measures that may be considered for potential adoption in the program, and um, the criteria are as follows. Uh, CMS must, uh, I'm sorry, the measure must adhere to CMS statutory requirements. The measure um, assesses meaningful performance differences between facilities. Measures must be fully developed, tested, and validated in the acute inpatient setting and measures towards uh, will provide CMS with technical assistance and clarifications on the measures as needed. Thank you. All right, thank you, Vanita. And just to quickly announce again, the Skilled Nursing Facility Value-Based Purchasing Program, uh, which was the last program in this segment, was actually presented during segment one. So that concludes segment three for today. We are going to now uh, turn it over to uh, Martin, who can remind folks on how to enter a question using the WebEx panel. So Martin, if you could do that, that would be awesome. Sure. Um, just as a reminder, uh, you can enter questions through the Q&A WebEx feature. That's located in the lower right side of the screen. Um, go ahead and type in your question and make sure to um, click send. Okay, and Michelle, as of right now, we don't have any questions yet for segment three, so I will let you know if any come in. Okay, and while we're waiting, if we could move to the next slide, um, which is slide 20, there we go, next steps. And I'll just quickly cover this information while folks formulate questions if they have them. So um, the first bullet there that you see, that is our measure under consideration open forum number two. So that is the fourth in my education and outreach series. Um, we're gonna be basically covering a lot of the same information that we covered last Thursday. So if you happen to miss last Thursday's session, feel free to join us um, the day after tomorrow for that session. And uh, if you need the link to register for that event, please feel free to shoot me an email, which is found at the end of the slide deck, and I'd be happy to send you the link to register. And then, of course, later this summer, um, for our federal stakeholders that are in the audience, uh, look for a message to register for that up and coming meeting to take place on August 3rd, which is, again, to preview our measures under consideration list. And then, um, just a reminder, all of these sessions, the four, um, the two, two that took place last week and today's session and this Thursday's, are all being recorded, so they will be available for future viewing up on the CMS website. Um, so it, you can feel free to pass along to your colleagues uh, that may have missed these sessions. And then, of course, if you think of questions uh, after the fact, please feel free to email me and I'll make sure I get those over to the right measure and program leads to respond. So with that, I'm gonna pause for a moment and ask uh, Mary if any additional questions have come in. Yes, we do have one question um, and it is for actually all the programs. 
So the question is, for all programs, are only Medicare fee-for-service patients required in the measure calculation and reporting to CMS? Or are all types of payers' patients um, can include it in the increased sample size? So this is Maria Durham. Um, you know, that's going to depend on the program and the legislative guidance that is governing that program. For the hospital reporting programs, it's at all patients, uh, not just Medicare. Okay. Okay, thank you. Um, there are no other questions at this time, Michelle. All right, well, I, I want to just uh, stop for a second and send a huge thank you out to all of our audience members for joining us today. We appreciate your time and attention to this important topic for rulemaking, and I want to thank all of our presenters for taking their time today. So with that, we're going to go ahead and conclude. Everybody have a great spring. Thank you.